Welcome to Olivet Bible Church online service. I am delighted to welcome you again today. And remember, today is our covenant service, which comes up first Sunday of every month. That means we'll be taking the Holy Communion. I encourage you to pair your bread and wine to join us when we start taking the communion. Later on in the service, I'll be returning to give you additional information. And while the service is going on, please um, contact us, engage with us, communicate with us using our chat room. We'll be expecting to hear from you. Now, let's pray. In Jesus' name, our Father and our God, we thank you for this wonderful day. We thank you for another covenant service you have brought us to. My God and my Lord, even as we take the covenant service, we shall receive the blessing that comes with it. My Father, my God, we roll over this service into your hand. Let it be a blessing to all that will hear you today, that will hear the message, oh God. My Father, my God, have this your morning, way in our lives. In Jesus' our hands. name. He alone deserves our praise this morning. Come on, lift your hands wherever you are. Lift your hands. Say, Lord God, I love you. Tell him how much you love him. Oh God, thank you. Thank you for life. Thank you for the gift of life, oh God. We bless your holy name wherever you are, wherever you are. Don't sit down. Don't stand up and worship God. Lift your hands. Lift your hands. Open up your mouth. Lord, we we'll thank you for who you are. You alone deserve our praise. You alone deserve the lifting up of our hands, oh God. Lord God, we've come to worship you in truth and in spirit this morning. Thanking you for all that you've done. Thank you for the victories we've recorded in your name. Thank you for the power in your blood, for the power in your name. Thank for the power in your word. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for the gift of the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Father, for the angels that are ministering unto us, are ministering for us, oh God. We bless your holy name, oh God. To you be all, all the praise and glory. To you belong all the glory, honor. Oh God, we bless your holy name, oh God. Who is like our God in all the world? From east to west, there's no king like our God. There's no Lord like our God. There's no creator like our God. You are the only Lord of God, we well, thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for our, for our families. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for all living Bible church. Thank you for bringing us down here today. Thank you for this blessed day that you made and you set aside for us, oh God, just to bless us and honor us. We we'll bless your holy name wherever you are. Just lift your hands and, and, and continue thanking Him. Tell Him, oh God, we we'll love you. We we'll love you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Amen. Somebody shouts hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, let's dance unto the Lord this morning. He alone deserves the lifting up of our heads and the shaking of our bodies. <laughs> and he, he also deserves a smile. <laughs> Come on, give the Lord a smile this morning. Hallelujah. Hey, hey, hey. When Jesus says yes, nobody can say no. <laughs> Hey, and when he lifts you up, nobody can put you down. Listen. <laughs> hey. When Jesus says yes, nobody can say no. When Jesus says yes, <laughs> nobody can say no. When Jesus says yes, nobody can say no. When Jesus <laughs> says yes, hey. nobody can say no. When Jesus lifts you up, nobody can bring you down. When Jesus says hey. yes, nobody can say no. When Jesus blesses you, nobody can curse you. When Jesus says yes, nobody can say no. When Jesus says you are blessed, nobody can curse you. When Jesus says ah. yes, nobody can say no. Jesus is a mighty God. Jesus is a mighty God. Jesus is a mighty God. Oh, Jesus is a mighty God. Oh, Jesus is a mighty God. Our God is the mighty God. All powers bow before Him. All powers bow before Him. 
In heaven and earth, the power before him. Oh, powers bow before him. Oh, Jesus is the mighty God. Oh, Jesus is the mighty God. Hey, oh, powers bow before him. Oh, powers bow before him. Come on, everybody, give the Lord a dance of faith this morning. Hey, hey, hey. He deserves the lead of the mighty God. He's a mighty God. Jesus is the mighty God. He's a mighty God. All powers bow before him. He's a mighty God. Every power bow before him. He's a mighty God. Come on, give the Lord a clap of hand and dance of this morning. Hallelujah. Woo! your holy name. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for a day as this that you've set aside to bless us. Thank you Jesus. Thank you Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Jesus, O Dio, ye dikagi. Jesus, O Dio, ye dikagi. Can you join me this morning as we worship God? Jesus, O Dio, ye dikagi. Jesus, a dear Oh, sing Jesus, a dear Nedikaki. He never knows, oh God. Oh, dear Nedikaki. Keeper, 
You are keeper, oh God. There's no keeper like our God. There's no healer like our God. There's no helper like our God. Who else? Who else can we go to? Who else can we go to? Who else can we go to? Just lift your hands wherever you are. Just worship God. Let your lips bear fruit this morning. Just let your lips bear fruit this morning. Focus, focus on God. Let God be your audience this morning. Let God be your audience this morning. See no distractions. Allow no distractions. Just focus your spirits. Focus your hearts onto God. He alone deserves the lifting up of our hands. He alone deserves true worship this morning. He alone, he alone for all that he has done, for all that he's doing, for all that he will do, that our eyes shall see. <laughs> oh, Pagagagahashadabaha. Eyes I would see, ears I would heard. Not as the mind of anyone been able to perceive what God has in store for you and your family. Oh, God. for giving us your son. Thank you for the blood that was shed. Thank you for your body that was broken. Thank you, Father, for the, for the communion of the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Jesus, for a day as this. Oh, we we'll bless your name. 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 We we'll bless. Come on, make melody in your heart this morning. Make melody in your heart this morning. And tell him there's no one like him. There's no king like him. There's no God like our God. There's no creator like our God. There's no one like our King, oh God. He's a strong and blessed one. Oh, Come on, lift your hands and praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hello, people of God. I bring you greetings again in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ from Olivet Bible Church. I bring greetings to your homes and families in Jesus' name. Today is our covenant service, our July covenant service. Uh, let's talk about our healing, a done deal. Our healing, a done deal. Let's read from Hosea chapter 11, verses 1 to 4. It reads, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. As they called them, so they went from them. They sacrificed to the bells and burned incense to carve the images. I taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I drew them with gentle cords, with bands of love, and I was to them as those who take the yoke from their neck. I stooped and fed them. Let's read it in the Amplified uh, Bible. From verse 1, when Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. The more the prophets called to them, the more they went from them. They kept sacrificing to Baals and burning incense to the graven images. Yet I taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by their arms or taking them up in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. Verse 4, 
I drew them with cords of a man with bands of love, and I was to them as one who lifts up and eases the yoke over their cheeks. And I bent down to them and gently laid food before them. Then let's read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that, chapter, that portion on the communion. Let me take it from verse 20. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in, or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. Verse 23. For indeed... I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it. In remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the lost body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we will not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. Lest you come together for judgment, and the rest I will say in order when I come. Father, we thank you in Jesus' precious name for this moment. Father, we are asking for light, for enlightenment. Father, make our healing in Christ a revelation to us. Born this knowledge into our souls and into our hearts in a way that we will carry the consciousness of it anywhere we are. Father, in a season like this, we need your healing power active in our lives. We need the revelation of healing. And we come before you today. Father, give us light indeed in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the scripture we read in Hosea chapter 11, verse 3 in particular, was revealed to me in 1992. There was a, this period I was very sick with malaria. And um, I was resisting it, resisting it. But the one night I had one very serious fever. And um, in my mind, it was like I was getting to the end of that thing. But then a, a, a relation talked to me. And uh, the next day I went to hospital and, uh, you know, got medications for the treatment. Uh, when the day I started that medication uh, that night... I'm not saying we don't need, even after that, I've had to take some medications when it's necessary. You know, but um, that night, I was, I couldn't sleep. I just knew that God wanted to speak to me around 12 in the midnight. So I went to the sitting room, and I was sitting there with my Bible. I just knew that God wanted to speak to me. I just knew it within myself. And then as I opened my Bible, there was Hosea 11. Uh, verse 3 and uh, I read it it was just like it leapt out of the Bible and was looking at me he said yet I taught Ephraim to walk taking them by their arms but they did not know that I healed them they did not know that I healed them I taught Ephraim to walk taking them by their arms but they did not know that I healed them that night I wept a lot because I felt I had come very close to seizing on that reality, but I let it slip away. Uh, in that ignorance, I've suffered unnecessarily. But, and it's like many children of God, we suffer in the area of sickness and disease as if there is no provision of God for it. 
and we need to revisit and begin to look at it closely. We need to gaze on that serpent lifted on that wood, the type of Jesus on the cross and what he did for us. We need to go back to the cross concerning our healing, especially in a time like this on earth when there is so much commotion in the area of health and the, a pandemic is just embarrassing and harassing man and challenging all we have known before now in medicine and sciences. So there is a need for us to have more light from God in this area, know really what God has done for us. The, when you look at the Bible closely, right from the beginning, God takes our healing Seriously, he makes our healing a priority. By the time he brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, and uh, once they hit the wilderness on their way to the promised land, of course, we know they lingered long in that wilderness. The first thing he revealed to them about himself, he, he, the first redemptive name of God that he revealed to the children of Israel is there in Exodus 15, verse 26. And he said, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will not, he said, I put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians from the Lord who heals you. I am the Lord who heals you. So God took upon himself the responsibility of being a healer. So the, the, and you see, they journeyed through that wilderness, except when they broke covenants and the, the serpent beat them and all those things. You know, they, they, the Bible says there was not one feeble one amongst them. Not one. God showed indeed that he was their healer. He sustained them through the wilderness even though the terrain was very harsh and so on. But God showed, was with them all the way as the Lord, their physician. So the issue of healing, as it relates to the people of God, is one of God's top priorities. We should change our orientation and the way we look at sickness going forward. We should begin to look at it more closely from God's perspective. It's not a normal situation for us to be sick. Sickness is not a normal situation. We should get ourselves to the point where we have enough light as to what God has done for us in this area that whenever sickness and disease shows up, we query it because it's not supposed to be there. We need to begin to query it. We need to begin to query sickness and disease. In James 5.14, he says, if is, is anyone sick amongst you? And he told us to deal with how to deal with it. So it's not a normal situation. Sickness is not a normal situation for mankind, both in creation and in redemption. When God created man, he made him perfect. There was no sickness, there was no disease. All that came in as a result of Satan coming into the scene and then leading man astray. So in creation, there was no sickness or disease. And in redemption, God took away sickness and disease. So let's go back to what God has for us in this area. Let me start, let's start by talking about knowledge and ignorance and their impacts. Turn back to the book of Hosea, this time chapter 4, verse 6. Hosea, chapter 4, verse 6. It says, My people, that's God's people, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will reject you from being priests for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. He said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. When we are, even in the secular law court, they say ignorance of the law is not an excuse. As a matter of fact, when we are ignorant of what God has provided for us in an area, we have failed in our responsibility. We are supposed to know. We are supposed to search. We are supposed to pay diligent heed to what God says in his, in his word to us. And it has 
things to say in every area of our lives. So when we fail out of negligence to find out what God has put in place for us in a certain area, then we are in the mode of ignorance. And Satan will always cash in on our ignorance, take advantage of us, and take advantage of us in any area. And one of those areas is the area of health. Let me tell you, there is something um, very unusual with mankind about the area of health. Many people, many people read books. There are people that can read three books in one week, three sizable books in one week, read all kinds of novels, read all kinds of things to do with various courses. But the area that concerns us primarily, which is our health, many people hardly read anything about their, how their body functions and what the body needs to function properly, how the body works. Many people don't ever care to know about their body. And on the spiritual side, they don't care to know what God has to say about it. People don't care to know how does my body function, how can I keep it healthy. Even by reading books or by reading what God, the spiritual aspect, what God has in place for it. So we walk through life as if our health should be just a chance happening. Because of that ignorance, many are destroyed. So we need light, we need to pay attention to God. We need to pay due diligence to this area of our lives because it's very vital. If you neglect your health in pursuit of money, <laughs> there's another that says if you uh, neglect your health in pursuit of money, you say it's your enemy that will consume the wealth at the end of the day. So our health is very important. And the first redemptive name of God to Israel once they left Egypt and hid the wilderness is, I'm Jehovah Rapha, and the Lord, your physician, your doctor. And we need to begin to look at that properly. Praise God. Praise God. So you see God telling Israel, he said, I taught Ephraim also to walk, taking them by their arms, but they knew not that I healed them. He had, when you read that portion of scripture, Hosea uh, chapter 11 from verse 1 to 4, you see that he had a close walk with Israel. They did not know that God healed them. And so, because they did not know, the enemy would always take advantage of them. So we need to pause a bit and consider our health, especially to know what God has to say in the area of health. Because the remedy of man comes to an end. It's limited. It's God that gave doctors and, and so on the knowledge they apply. But sometimes, and a lot of times, their knowledge comes to an end. They come to their wit's end in trying to handle a situation. I've seen doctors, I've witnessed doctors come to the end of themselves in handling things that don't even look so serious because they don't know what else to do. I've seen it. I've also seen revelations of physician, a physician when he got tired. So the physician needed help. Okay, so um, let's look at John chapter 8. John chapter 8 from verse 32. Let me read it from verse 31. Then Jesus says to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, if you continue in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And you shall, if you continue in my word, in this area of health, God is con calling us to abide and continue his word, find out what he has to say and dwell in it. In the course of, of, of that study, in the course of that finding out inquiry, we shall know the truth and the truth shall make us free. On a normal day, sickness should not be part of us. Where there is sickness, there is always there, should, there, there, there is an open door. There is an open door somewhere. Something is wrong somewhere. Either ignorance or some other thing. Or negligence. Something, there is an open door. Because that's a work of the devil. Whether you call it sin, sickness, or disease, or poverty, it's all the same person. It's the devil. So Jesus said to those who believed in him, if you abide in my word, the King James says, 
if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they answered him like many people will answer. We are Abraham's descendants, and we have never been in bondage to anyone. How say you, you will be free? And that's a lie there. They were in bondage politically. They were in bondage uh, uh, physically. They were in bondage to sin and so on spiritually. In all dimensions, they were in bondage. As at the time, they were telling Jesus they are Abraham's children. Many of them that were present there he, he, were bound by sicknesses and diseases and needed healing, freedom. How do you say you'll be free? And Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. He started with sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but the son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. If Jesus makes you free, that's when you're free indeed. And then in the area of health, we are talking of Jesus making us free indeed. We have to find out what has God got in place for us in this area. It's a very vital area and it's very critical now on earth. Let's look at the nature of healing. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. First of all, sin is spiritual. Sin is spiritual. But brings certain effects in the natural. Sin is a spiritual thing. Look at Isaiah 53, verse 6. This chapter, of course, we know is talking about the Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. Verse 6, he says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all, the sins, lawlessness of us all. This was when Jesus was hanging on the cross. It's not like God carried banners and badges and put them on him, labeling them. This one is murder. This one is stealing. This one is adultery. This one is fornication. But sin is a spiritual thing. On the cross, God laid our sin on Jesus Christ. Because God made him the lamb, the, 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 behold the lamb of God that takes away the sin, that sin nature, spiritual, it's a spiritual nature that man inherited from Satan at his fall. So sin is spiritual and it's important we understand it. And so the remedy for sin must be spiritual. So we see God on the cross laying our sins on Jesus Christ. But we didn't see any physical thing he put on him, so it was a spiritual laying of our sin on him. Sin is spiritual. It came from a spirit being Satan. Is spiritual in nature. Okay? Note that. It's important we note that. Now, sickness is also spiritual. Sickness is spiritual. Now, look at verse 9 and verse 10 of this same chapter, 53 of Isaiah. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. Because he had done no violence nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet, verse 10, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It pleased the Lord to bruise him, to crush him. He has put him to grief, to sickness, to distress. When you make his soul an offering for sin, God made his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Now look at that, the A part closely. It says, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief, to sickness. He has made him sick. The Amplifier said, yet it was the will of the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief and made him sick. Now what happened is, of course the Roman soldiers whipped Jesus until he, his body was completely battered. 
But that was physical weeping. So he carried wounds in his physical body. Those are symptoms. But spiritually, while they were laying sickness, afflicting his body physically, the Roman soldiers, God spiritually laid a sickness on Jesus Christ. So all those symptoms were a manifestation of a spiritual reality. Jesus was made sin for us. And he was made sick for us. He was made sin with our sin in his atonement. And he was made sick with our sickness. Spiritually, God laid a sin on him. Spiritually, God laid a sickness on him. So sickness is of a spiritual nature. And then it manifests in physical symptoms. Understand that. And so if sickness is spiritual in nature, just like sin, the remedy for it must also be spiritual. The remedy must be spiritual. So we can't just end up with physical remedies if we are going to be free indeed from sickness and from sin and sickness and disease and all that. The remedy is spiritual. And we need to begin to understand that. We need a revelation of the healing, our healing in Christ. Our healing is a done deal, something already settled by God. There is no other sacrifice God is going to make for the sins of man. And there is no other atonement he's going to make for our sickness and disease. He has atoned. One sacrifice for all solutions. One remedy for all maladies. One remedy, one sacrifice for everything that came on mankind. It's one package. Sin is spiritual. The solution must be spiritual. Sickness is spiritual. The solution must be spiritual. Sickness is spiritual, I said, right? The solution must be spiritual. And we need to know it. We need to know it. So why the Roman soldiers bruised Jesus physically? God bruised him spiritually. He was wounded for transgressions. He was bruised for iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was on him, and with his stripes we are healed. Sickness is spiritual. Symptoms are physical. He carried wounds on his physical body by the Roman soldiers, but that was a picture depicting a, a spiritual reality he faced at that moment of atoning for us. In Jonah 2 verse 8, the Bible says that they that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. Those who observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. Some translations say those who observe worthless idols forsake their own source of mercy. Uh, that's amplified. It says, forsake their own source of mercy and loving kindness. Those who observe worthless idols forsake their own mercy. Those worthless, those lying vanities are symptoms. Those who observe symptoms and get consumed for it miss out on the mercy they could have. Are we still here? Those who observe lying vanities, symptoms are not the real issue. The real issue is spiritual. Deal with the spirit source and the symptoms disappear and wear out over time. Sometimes it's instant, at other times they wear out in time. But the solution is spiritual and that's what God provided for. So that's about, we are talking about the nature of healing. It's sin that led to sickness and disease. Sin is spiritual in nature. We've seen that sickness also is spiritual in nature. And the solution God provided was not a physical solution. It was not really the chastisement of the Roman soldiers that brought healing, that atoned for our sicknesses and diseases. It was the bruising of God, spiritual on Jesus, that atoned for our sickness and disease. All that the Roman soldiers did was just a physical manifestation of a spiritual reality. Now, let's talk of faith versus sight of feelings. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, we read, we walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by faith and not by sight. For we walk by faith and not by sight. 
when you talk of sight, you are talking of visible appearance of things. Things you can see with the natural eyes. Things you, well, he, he, he's, he, he's talking about, it's like saying, we walk by faith and not by the five senses. We walk by faith, not by our five senses. Not by our feelings. We walk by faith, not by visible appearance of things. There is the invisible aspect of everything. And this invisible aspect forms the object of faith. Faith deals with the invisible things. The object of faith is invisible things. Not things we can see, feel, touch, smell, taste, and so on. Faith deals with the invisible. In other words, faith deals with the spirit realm. We continue measuring ourselves by how we are feeling. We are observing lying vanities. We will miss out on our mercy. Smith Wigglesworth said something somewhere. He said, I never asked this man, how are you feeling? That's himself. He said, he never asked himself, how are you feeling? We walk by faith, not by feelings. We walk by faith, not by feelings. So, feelings and sight deal with symptoms. Sometimes you have to even gauge, begin to sense whether there is still something you're feeling somewhere. You say, yeah, there is still a little pain somewhere. <laughs> Forget the little pain. When you neglect certain things, they die naturally. Faith deals with invisible roots of those visible things. Feelings and sight have to do with symptoms. Faith deals with the invisible roots. The invisible roots of those things we see physically. And that's where God applies his remedies. And that's where God sources his remedies. And that's where he expects us by faith to draw our remedies from. Let's talk about forgiveness and healing. In the sight of God, the atonement of Jesus is a one-time or a one-off solution for all human challenges that we, man received when he fell, when he succumbed to Satan and fell. So in the sight of God, the sacrifice of Jesus was enough to take care of everything man lost and brought upon himself when he fell. It's a one-off solution to all human challenges. So in the eyes of God, forgiveness and healing are the same. Forgiveness and healing are the same in the eyes of God. If your sins are forgiven, he sees you healed. It's you that see yourself sick and entertain what should not be. Because we've not really gotten a revelation, a revelation of these things because we've not really paid the price to search and say, God, what are you saying in this area? As long as there is a chemist or somewhere to go to a, a hospital, we tend, all of us, most of us, use those props instead of saying, God, what's this solution? If the sun sets you free, that's when you are free indeed. No other remedy provides a total solution, a complete solution, apart from what Jesus Christ has to offer us. Look at Luke. So, forgiveness and healing are interchangeable. Look at Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, from verse 17. Now it happened on a certain day, as he was teaching, that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by, who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judah, uh, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. The power of God was present to heal them. And the power of God is spiritual. It's a spiritual remedy to human physical problems. 
Because those problems have a spiritual root. The power of God is not like something you can touch like this. It's spiritual, but it's real. It's real. Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they would bring him in because of the crowd, including those that were not there for healing, the Pharisees that were there to look for faults, to, to check his English, whether it's correct, to, to check his dress, blocked the whole road. People that needed solution were, were looking for a way to get to Jesus. And then, verse 18, Then, behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him, and they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, know that Jesus saw in their action, he saw their faith. And when he saw their faith, we see a similar statement elsewhere. And when he saw their faith, how did he see their faith? In their action. He could see it in their action. He could see it on their faces, their determination. He could see their, 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 their how do I put, desperation to get answer from him. That act of getting to Jesus at any cost showed they had faith. When he saw their faith, he said to them, man, your sins are forgiven you. The man needed healing. Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I said to you, arise and take up your bed and go to your house. And immediately he rose up before them and took up what he had been lying on and departed to his own house glorifying God. And they were all amazed. And they glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, we have seen strange things today. Jesus saw a man that needed healing. He said, your sins are forgiven you. That act of God that forgave his sins is the same act of God that healed him. It's the same thing. You either say, be healed, or you can say, you're forgiven. Something, the sin nature of man brought all these things on him. When the sin is gone, the symptoms have no right to stay. Where there is forgiveness, symptoms have no right to stay. So we need to begin to query some things. If my sins are forgiven, why am I sick? Why should say, Satan has no right to put this thing on me? We need to begin to query sickness and disease, not just walk as if it's just any of those things. When in those days people needed healing from neighboring countries, they went to Israel. They went to Israel. Because they knew that in Israel, the God of Israel will heal. We are the children of Abraham. Our God is in the healing business. Catherine Kuhlman will tell you, I believe in miracles. And the way she will put it is, I believe in miracles because I believe in God. I believe in healing because I believe in God. God is a healing God. He's a healing God. We need to begin to query things. Lord, why is it like this? And then when, when you know that there's nothing you have done that should bring that up, you, you, you have a right to test it and get out. We, are, we should not carry what Jesus carried away from us. We should not harbor what he took away, what he sacrificed, suffered for, and took away from us. So the very act of God that forgives sins is the very act that heals diseases. It's one package. Even in the Old Covenant, we read in Isaiah 33, verse 24, And the inhabitant 
will not say, I'm sick. They will not have cause to say, I'm sick. The people who dwell in it will be forgiven their iniquity. The act of forgiveness takes care of sin. So we should note that. Is the, the very act of God that forgives our sins is the very act of God that heals us. Look at James chapter 5. James chapter 5. James chapter 5. Let's begin to challenge things that come against us. Sometimes what Satan does, he bombards you, bombards you, you are resisting, he bombards you, he has done it to most of us. Until you relax and feel that's just part of it. It's not part of it. The inhabitant shall not say I'm sick. Because the people that dwell there shall be forgiven their sins. Where sin is forgiven, Satan has no right to bring disease and sickness. James 5 verse... Let me read verses 13 and 14. Is any among you suffering? Let him pray. The King James says, Is any among you, is anyone afflicted? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? It's not the order of the day. Is there anyone among you sick? It's not the norm for us to be sick. But here, the Holy Spirit is writing through James. Is anyone among you sick? He says, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. When the elders gather and administer healing to that person, if there is a sin in that person's life, is dealt with. It's one package. It's one package, forgiveness and healing. It's one package. There are two signs of the same coin. And the inhabitant of the land shall not sound sick. Because the people that dwell therein shall be forgiven their sins. Now, let's talk of faith and mercy. Faith and mercy. Healing is an act of mercy of God. Healing is an act of mercy of God. God delights in showing mercy. Look at Micah chapter 7, verses 7, uh, 18 to 20. Micah chapter 7. Micah chapter 7, verses 18 to 20. It says, Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity, and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. God delights in showing mercy. That's his specialty. That's what, that's what makes his heart beat. Because he delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will give truth to Jacob and mercy to Abraham which you have sworn to our fathers from days of old. God delights in, in showing mercy. And one of the mercies of God is the mercy of healing. The mercy of healing. Now, a lot of times in the scriptures, you see Jesus says to somebody who has just healed, your faith has made you whole. Your faith has made you whole. Your faith has made you whole. For instance, the woman with the issue of blood, and I want us to read these things. I want us to look at scriptures. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Mark chapter 5 from verse 24. Mark chapter 5 from verse 24. Let's look at Mark chapter 5 from verse 24. Okay, let me take you back to verse 21. Now, when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. That's what he worshipped him. And begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she will, she will live. That's faith. 
So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Now, while he was heading towards this man, Jairus' house, Jairus was in a hurry to get the daughter healed. He was intercepted by a woman. Verse 25. Now, a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years. The King James says had an issue of blood. There are many other issues apart from blood. There is the issue of arthritis, the issue of the knees, the issue of the ne neck, waist, everywhere. It must not be an issue of blood, but you can put yourself in the same setting where Jesus healed this woman. Okay. Now, a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. And she had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. Doctors have failed her. When she heard about Jesus, she heard there is a man that heals, that preaches the gospel and heals. She came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, she heard about Jesus. She heard this man heals. This man delivers. This man sets people free. This man shows mercy. She said, I, I'm, I'm moving. So, uh, she was not supposed to mix with that crowd. It's not, just like a leper. She was considered unclean according to the law then. But she defied, defied all odds and said, I must get to him. So she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made whole. And immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched me? Who touched me? And the disciples said to him, you see the multitude thronging you and you say, who touched me? He looked around to see her who had done this thing. He looked around. But the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. So we see here, she exercised faith. There is no do much preaching to do on that. She exercised faith and got healing. Did you, did you notice that? She actually, let me in quote, stole that healing. But Jesus sensed that something left him. Said, somebody touched me with a touch of faith. So it was her faith. She said, your, if your faith has made you whole. You see another situation like that in Acts chapter 14. Look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 14. Acts of the Apostles chapter 14. I read verses 9 and 10. Okay, let's ask 14. Let's take it from verse 8. And in Lystra, this Paul now, in, in his ministry, and in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting. This man was kind of paralyzed in his feet. Well, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. This man had Paul speaking. The woman with the issue of blood heard about Jesus and what he was doing and saying. This man had Paul speaking. Paul observing him intently, looking at him and seeing that he had faith to be healed. Paul, Paul could, see, could see on him that this man was reaching out by faith. On his face was showing it. That he, Paul could discern that this man had faith to be healed. To be, to be healed. What Paul was preaching generated faith in him. Paul, whatever was that, it was like he was restless to get out of that state. So Paul saw something that said this man has faith to be healed. Said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and walked. So you see, it was this man's faith and then the word of Paul helped him. He exercised faith. There was faith. He had faith to be healed. The Bible recorded that. That's one way. God demands faith from us. 
But there are other times when it's just the mercy of God and it has nothing absolutely to do with your faith for you to be healed. Nothing. You are not even expecting it. Just the mercy of God floods your way and takes care of your ailment and gets you whole. That's what that man at the pool of Bethesda experienced. So let's look at that situation too. So let's look at that man in John chapter 5. The man at the pool of Bethesda in John chapter 5. Let's read from verse 1. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. After this, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And there was... And there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In this lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. And whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now, a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. He had spent 38 years of his life in that situation, paralyzed. When, he, when Jesus saw him lying there, he was just lying there wasting, and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is tired up. But while I'm coming, how can he move fast when his sickness is paralysis? He will crawl and there are people that, uh, some people, uh, their own is uh, skin disease. Their legs had no problem. They would jump in ahead. That's why he was there for long. He said, he said, do you want to be healed? But look at you, do you want to be made whole? That simple question, yes or no? And he began to tell his life history. The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is tired up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. That's not the answer to that question. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. It had nothing to do with the man's faith. Nothing. God just showed him mercy. Jesus preempted the whole thing and carried it out. And immediately the man was made well and took off his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. And the Jews were angry. He healed somebody on the Sabbath. If you are listening to what people say, you won't do anything for God. Of course, we know about the anointing, the power of God. The Bible said, where we read in Mark chapter 5, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. The anointing of the Holy Spirit was present to heal. The anointing is the power of God that leaves burdens and destroys yokes. Isaiah 10, 27, Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. Sickness is an oppression of the devil. The devil is the oppressor. Jesus is the healer. The devil is the oppressor. Jesus is the healer. The devil is the oppressor. Sickness is an oppression of the devil. Jesus is the healer. So, let's talk about healing in the atonement. Isaiah 53, 1 to 4. Isaiah 53, 1 to 4. Isaiah 53, 1 to 4. Who has believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, a man of sorrows, a man of pains, and acquainted with grief, sicknesses, a, a man of, but when you look at the life of Jesus Christ as revealed in the four gospels, 
four witnesses. You didn't see Jesus physically sick at any point in time. That was not, but the Bible calls him a man of sorrows, a man of pains, and acquainted with sickness. That was in his atonement. That was in his sacrifice. God made him all those for us. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we, we hid as it were faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs. That's our sicknesses and distresses. He has borne our griefs, our sicknesses, and carried our sorrows, our pains. That's, those words, that's what the Hebrew mean. He has, surely he has borne, he has carried our sicknesses. He has borne our sicknesses, took them upon himself, and carried our pains. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted, as if he was suffering for his own sins. But it was for us. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was wounded for us, for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, verse 6. We have turned everyone to his own, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The way he laid our iniquity on him was the way he laid our, our sickness and disease on him. He bore them in his body on the cross. We need to begin to renew our mind. And by his stripes, we are healed. Even Isaiah when he was prophesying several centuries before Jesus came, put himself on the scene and said, by his stripes we are healed. A done deal. In that atonement, we are healed by his stripes. It's a done deal. It's not a promise. It's not a promise. Jesus has done it. It's not a promise. It's a done deal. It's something already settled. It's something already accomplished. It's not a promise. It's not God saying, uh, I will heal you in Christ. He said, by his trials, you're healed. And it will be the pleasure of the Lord. Look at verse 10 and verse 11. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief, to, to sickness, and made him sick. When you make his soul an offering for sin. Offering for sin, offering for sickness and disease. Offering for sin, offering for sickness and disease. Verse 11. Okay, he, he said, when, let's take verse 10 again. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. What's the pleasure of the Lord? To see us walking in the reality of what Jesus has accomplished for us. Our sins forgiven, we walking in righteousness, no more guilty, walking in health, no more sick, walking in, 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 in wealth. In wealth, don't allow the abuses and the things that have happened Increasing them over a while to put the words wealth and riches out of your mouth. It's what, part of what Jesus paid for. Even though he was rich, yet for our sakes he was made poor that we through his poverty we have a better deal. Don't let anyone shut your mouth or make you chicken out of what God did because they are accusing us. They will always they accuse Jesus. So why wouldn't they accuse us? Where we have made mistakes, all we need to do is to repent. Are you still there? Yeah, but we must walk in what Jesus has done. The good pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. That's when we begin to walk in his victory. The victory he has purchased for us. Then look at verse 11. He shall see the labor of his soul. The King James says he shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. He said, when Jesus sees us walking in the reality of these things he, went, he, he paid for, he suffered for, that he sacrificed for, when he sees us, our sins forgiven, 
having repented, walking in a new life, walking in strength and health, walking in victory. The Bible says he shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. He will look at us and say, it was worth it. That's his reward. That's his reward for all that pain, for all that suffering, for laying down his life when we walk in the reality of those things. So there is nothing just like you as a natural father. When your son or child is, is sick, you're not happy, you're not yourself. The same way, when we are sick, when we are not supposed to be, the inhabitant of the Lord, land shall not say, I'm sick. The people that dwell there shall be forgiven their sins. When we, walk, when we are in sick and diseased and, and wretched and poor, God is not happy because he has already paid the ultimate price for, for us to reverse that situation. He said, don't deal. Jesus is not coming again to repeat a sacrifice. So we must walk in the reality of what we have now. By his stripes, we are healed. Let's say it in the present tense. By his stripes, we are healed. It's a present reality. Even Isaiah, who was prophesying into the future, spoke of it in terms of a present reality. By his stripes, we are healed. He said, by whose stripes we are healed. We are healed. Satan has cheated me. He has cheated you enough. Some have died. Some are sick. Some have spent all their living on hospital bills. Like that woman with the issue of blood. When God has perfected something else for us to walk in, by his stripes we are healed. So when Jesus sees us walking in victory, walking in health, he will say it was worth it. That's his satisfaction. That's his reward for all that. First Peter 2.24. 1 Peter 2.24. Let me read it in the New King James Bible I have here first. Then we read it in the Amplified. We read 24 and 25. Who himself, himself, somebody say himself. Who himself, himself, bore our sins in his own body, in his own body. Himself bore our sins. In other words, he carried our sins in his own body on the tree, that's on the cross. That we, being, that we having died to sins, might live for righteousness. By whose stripes we were healed. A settled thing, something already accomplished. By whose stripes we are healed. Let me read it in the Amplified. He personally bore our sins in his own body on the tree as an altar and offered himself on it that we might die, cease to exist to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Jesus has done spiritually in our record, we are healed. Legally, we are healed. But we need to move into that experience in reality. We are healed by his stripes. Verse 25 now says, For we are like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer or bishop of our souls. There was a time we were lost and suffered all kinds of things. But now, as believers, we have returned to the shepherd and bishop of our souls. We have returned to the covenant. We have entered the covenant that saved us. We have entered into our inheritance in God as accomplished in Christ. And we need to begin to walk in that reality. And so the, we talk of the gospel in Romans 1, verse 16. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone that believes. Preach the gospel. Tell them, preach it. That's what I'm telling you. Jesus has done it. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, to save, to heal, to deliver anyone that believes. He said, preach the gospel. Let them know. Jesus says, preach. Let them know I fully paid the price. I've broken the curse. I took the curse. Your curse upon myself. Let them know the curse I took. I took personally your curse upon myself on the tree so that I will remove it from you. 
I removed it from you. I put it on myself. I paid for it. Let them know I've broken the curse. Let them know I've redeemed them from that curse. I've made a way for them. Let them know I've made a way for them. Let them know I have saved them. Let them know I have healed them. I taught Ephraim also to walk, taking them by my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. And because they did not know, they continued in sickness. They did not know. After the abolition of slavery, those mean slave masters held some slaves in plantations, working for several years. How did they do it? They made sure they didn't hear the news that they were free. And that's the way Satan operates. Let the knife open the door of life for them. I've done the tough ones. He said, as often as you drink this, eat this bread and drink this cup, you're proclaiming the Lord's death. The communion table is, is declaring the gospel. You do show the Lord's death till he comes, the manner of his death. And so let's round off with the Lord's Supper. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 11 as we begin to wind down. 1 Corinthians 11. The devil has many ways of cheating Christians nowadays. One of those ways is impatience. You go to a church, you just want a 30 minute service and you go home to do nothing. Is it in 30 minutes service that you will know what God did for you? Because I know from that impatience, I know you're not even reading the Bible at home. You're not praying at home. How many Christians are really praying people nowadays? And so the devil will do everything in his power to keep people ignorant. And he does that. Praise God. 1 Corinthians 11. Let's go back to it. For I, I re- from verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus Christ in the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take it, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. In remembrance of me. Jesus, before he died, instituted the communion, the breaking of bread with his disciples. And Paul was not there when that happened. But he, Paul was somebody who was going to use massively. He revealed to him what he delivered to the apostles in that night. He said, the idea is from the Lord I got this revelation. And that's what actually happened. Uh, the, 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 what he saw in that revelation was actually what he did. He said, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. He wants us to relive that moment when he died on our behalf, when he suffered on our behalf. There are only three rituals that God left in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, you can't count, I can't tell you, I've not been able to count them. But the three rituals are baptism in water by immersion, uh, anointing with oil, and the Lord's Supper, the communion meal, the covenant meal. Just three. So, there are not things we should make light of. Particularly, this, what Jesus kept emphasizing, he said, do this in remembrance of me. Do this. I took Ephraim by his, my arms. He said, I taught Ephraim also to walk, taking him by my arms. But they did not know that I healed them. They did not know. They did not know. Is it that God didn't want to teach them? And now, so Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. What does he mean by that? He's saying, it's like saying, I want you to keep taking this meal so that you will know and not forget. So that you will know what I did for you and not forget. This is a point where I need to keep you fresh with what I did on your behalf. 
live in the conscious reality of this, of my death and what it stands for, what it was all about. Do this in remembrance of me. That word remembrance is a Greek word that means recollection, to recollect what I did. It means a commemoration, commemoration. That's a celebration to honor the memory of some person or event. So it's a commemoration, a, 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 a meal, a celebration to honor the memory of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross in his death, in his sacrifice, what he did, to make sure we always, we celebrate it, we honor him, celebrate him, honor what he did, and keep remembering what he did and what he stands for for us. Because it was all about us. It's to honor the memory of someone or something with a ceremony or an object. So when we lift the bread, when we take the cup, we are talking of Jesus who, whose body was broken, battered for us physically, battered by the Roman soldiers, spiritually battered by God himself for us. We are talking of Jesus Christ who laid down, who shed his blood. His blood was physical, but his blood was life. So he was bleeding physically, and his life was going spiritually. He, his life left him when he shed the last jot of blood. We are honoring that memory of Jesus and what he did in that defining moment in human history on our behalf. So in this case, the communion is a covenant meal that the Lord himself instituted to honor his memory and to keep us remembering his death and what his death was all about. He said, do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are showing forth or declaring the Lord's death until he comes. Each time you will come, we are saying, Jesus died for me. Jesus suffered for me. Jesus healed me by his sacrifice. So, do this in remembrance of me means that the participant at the communion may remember Jesus Christ and the nature of his death, an atoning and expiatory sacrifice, vicarious suffering, that suffering on behalf of someone else, done on behalf of others, and it's us. As you approach the communion table, hear Jesus today telling you, remember my cross. Remember what I went through. It was on your behalf. Remember my wounds. Paul wrote to a certain church and said, remember my bonds. He was imprisoned at that point in time. Say, remember my bonds. Jesus says, remember my wounds. Remember I shed my blood to the last dot on your behalf. Remember my blood I shed to the last drop. My life I laid down. Remember I did it all for you. Remember I was atoning for you. I was paying the penalty for your sins. I took your place in suffering. I was making amends for you. I did it to relieve you, to cleanse your guilt and purchase your freedom. I gave my life for you, remember. So now, as we get set to partake of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ in this covenant service, remember him. Remember Jesus. Remember this in remembrance of me. Remember him. Remember how he died. Remember he was taking your place. He was the Lamb of God that took away our sin and all that came with it. Remember what happened to his body. He was, it was broken, battered for, 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 for me as an individual and for you. Remember what happened to his blood. It was shed for you to the last drop. And remember why it had to be so. It was the only way to save us. It was the only way out for us. It's all because of me and you. Let's study to know this. Let's study to know this. God, Jesus wants us to keep remembering. Keep remembering. Keep remembering. That's the way we can retain his life, his strength, what he purchased on our behalf. Let's study to know this. 
He said, you do show the Lord's date. When you, as long as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're showing the Lord's date. That means to announce, you're announcing the Lord's death. You're skipping it fresh until he comes. Keep announcing it until he comes. He said, he that drinks. So examine yourself. So he said, to, he that eats and drinks in an unworthy manner. To eat in an unworthy manner is to, is to eat the bread and the cup irreverently. Irreverently. And with, without seriousness. In other words, we should come before the communion table with respect, utmost respect, and with seriousness. One of the reasons, he said, he that is in an unworthy manner is damnation to himself. He said, for this reason, many are sick and weak, and some have died. Eating in an unworthy manner is eating disrespectfully. The blood of Jesus Christ is not what you should handle like any other thing you've handled. Say not when you are not discerning. They, they bring damnation on them and they say it's not discerning the lost body. Not distinguishing it. Not making a distinction and the difference of it. This is a different thing. This is not an ordinary meal. This is a sacred meal. This is a covenant meal. The healing meal. The Passover meal. The Lost Supper. The body of Jesus broken, wounded for us and his blood shed for us. It's nothing ordinary. Praise God. In closing, in conclusion, remember Hosea again, 11.3. I taught Ephraim also to walk. Took them along, taking them by their arms or by my arms. I walk, I've walked with Ephraim, but they knew not that I healed them. They didn't know that I healed them. They did, why didn't they know? He said that God didn't want to teach them. No, but it's God taking note. He said they didn't know. Walk, we walk, you can walk with God in a long stretch. And this area of healing is still, we are still trapped in it. Because we don't even know. We've not taken the time to know. And it's time to begin to know. That word know is from a Hebrew word yoda. And it means to perceive. It means to understand. They did not understand that I healed them. They did not perceive that I healed them. It means to acquire knowledge. They didn't acquire the knowledge. To, they didn't seek to know that I healed them. It means to discern. They didn't discern that I healed them. It means to know. It means to be aware of. They were not aware that I healed them. So the Lord's Supper, Jesus put it in place to keep us in constant awareness and consciousness and remembrance of his death and what it stands for, what it should mean to us. He said, do this in remembrance of me. So we have to move from sense knowledge now to a revelation knowledge of the sacrifice of Jesus. And this will come through prayers and dutiful study. That's the issue of the hour. God bless you. Why don't you take a few seconds, just think about this now. Meditate on what you've heard. Think about this. I thought if Ephraim also to walk, taking them by my arms, but they knew not that I healed them. And the inhabitants of the land shall not say I'm sick, because the people that dwell therein shall be forgiven their iniquities. By his stripes we were healed. If we were healed, then I was healed. If the Bible says by his stripes we are healed, if one person is not healed, we are not healed. So by his stripes we are healed. That means I'm healed. And if there is one sickness he left on, a, on, on, on resolved, then I'm not healed. So he healed all. He healed all. Just like you see many places when they gather when Jesus was physically here on earth. And with all manner of sickness and disease, he said that he healed them all. And he healed them all. And he healed them all. Matthew 8, 17. That it may be fulfilled. That word which was written. Himself. Himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Carried our sicknesses. What he carried away, we don't need to bear anymore. Think about this in a few seconds. Think about it. Think about it. How is this to you? What does it mean to you? Think about it. Not discerning the lost body. 
eating unworthy, not irreverently and not taking it serious. It's a serious matter. The Son of God died in our place in order to bring us complete freedom. Freedom indeed. Think about it. It's time to begin to challenge sickness and disease and the works of the devil in our lives and in our families. Remember your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Once my sins are forgiven, Satan has no right to touch this temple. I was bought with a prize. And I glorify God in my body and my spirit, which are God's. He said, he said you, you were bought with a prize. He said, you know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Know ye not, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which you have from God, and you're not your own. Somebody bought you, Jesus. God bought you with the sacrifice of his son. Spirit, soul, and body. And you're not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. This body is the temple of God. God bought me with a price. Satan, you have no right to touch this temple. And I challenge sickness and disease. Get out of my body. Get out of these homes. Do the same concerning yourself now in the name of Jesus Christ. Satan has no right. Where God has purchased, paid the ultimate price for a temple, for your body. Satan has no right to rule there. Sickness has no right there. Let's begin to query the devil. Query sickness and disease and tell you, get out. They must get out. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And not my own. God bought me with the price of the life of his son. So I must glorify God in my body and in my spirit which are God's. I don't like tattoos. But I, there was a time I was in England and I saw a tattoo that I, I, I liked. The, the, our host there bought a trampoline for his children and somebody was called in. One black guy was called in to install it. The company sent him to install it in their backyard. And when he came there, I saw a tattoo on his arm. He wrote there, God's property. I said, this is correct. God's property. My body belongs to God. My spirit belongs to God. God purchased me and not my own. What more Satan trying to own me through sickness and disease? No. Somebody say no. No. No, Jesus paid. And I stand on the authority of the word of God that declares to me that Jesus Christ sacrificed for my healing by his stripes and heals. Satan, I query you from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet. You have no right to touch me with sickness or disease. Jesus took them away. And so I tell you, symptoms die. Symptoms die in Jesus' name. Declare with me now. Say, I know that my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who I have from God, and are not my own. I was bought with a prize. Therefore, I glorify God in my body and in my spirit which are God's. My body and my spirit belong to God. Satan, you have no right. Jesus purchased me, got me out of your hands, redeemed me with a full price. Satan, you have no right to touch my life with sin. You have no right to touch my body with sickness and disease. And so sickness and disease, I command you in the name of Jesus, Leave now. Leave. Get out in the name of Jesus. Every spirit of infirmity, I rebuke you in every life here now in Jesus' name. Say that get your hands off the bodies of children of God. Get your hands off. I rebuke you spirits of infirmity. Out you go in Jesus' name. 
Father, thank you for healing me by the stripes of Jesus. Thank you for healing us. Give God thanks for healing you by the stripes of Jesus. Begin to meditate on these things. Begin to meditate. Listen to this message over and over at least seven times. Listen to this message at least seven times. Let it soak up your spirit and burn into your soul by the Spirit of God. I declare liberty to every captive in Jesus' name. Every lying vanity, every lying symptom, again a healing, I rebuke you. Die, you symptoms. Die in Jesus' name. Every pain, every disease, every symptom of sickness and disease. Die in Jesus' name. Every virus that is assigned to, to, to ravage this temple of God. Every fungus, every bacteria. All microbes that are assigned to harm our body. I command, die in the name of Jesus. Perish for our sake. The power of God destroys you, microbes, in Jesus' name. Father, let your healing power run through everybody now. From the crown of the head to the soles of our feet, restore health and healing. We thank you, Lord. I speak peace into your home. I speak peace into your life. I speak peace into your home. Father, restore order in anything that Satan has upset in any of these homes. Let divine order return. Divine life return. Divine health return in Jesus' name. Father, let divine order overrule the, the confusion of Satan in every home here. And in every life. In the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Father, beyond what I've spoken, shed your light. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And he brought that joy that flushed my soul. Something happened and now I know he touched me and made me who oh, he touched me he touched me oh he touched me and he brought the joy that flows my soul. Something happened. Holy Spirit, go ahead. Touch lives. Touch lives. Touch these bodies. I know He touched me and made me whole. Let's sing it again. He touched me. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. Father, restore our immunity to perfect working. In Jesus' name I pray. Restore the immunity of every one of us, our bodies, to perfection. Restore our immunity to perfection. In Jesus' name. Amen. No. He touched me and made me whole. Let's take it one more time. He touched me. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And he brought great joy that flows my soul. Something that happened. And now I know he touched me and made me whole. Holy Spirit, make this a revelation to us. 
our healing by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Make it a revelation to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Okay. You have heard the gospel. Jesus did it all for you. And the Bible says, as many as received him to them, he gave power to become the children of God. The Bible says, if you will confess you with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Jesus has done the tough part that we couldn't do. Your part is now to receive him by faith. Are you ready to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Pray this simple prayer. Say, Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you came in the flesh. You died on the cross of Calvary on my behalf. Lord Jesus, forgive my sins. I am a sinner. Forgive me. Remove the sin nature in me. I open my heart to you. Please come into my life now. I receive you into my heart as my Lord and my Savior. And I declare with my mouth, from this moment on, we shall be one. Thank you for receiving me. Lord Jesus, you say that he that comes unto you, you will know why it's cast away. Father, thank you for receiving these ones, giving them a new life. Thank you for the seed of a new life you've planted in this life. And now, Heavenly Father, I ask, oh, direct these ones to a Bible-believing church, to a, a flock, a congregation, a church, where they will be well-fed and nurtured to become all that you want them to be in life. And where they will serve you and they, they will receive of the fullness of what you have planned for them. I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stretch forth our hands. Towards the communion and the as we pray over the straight forth your hands towards the communion table in your house. Father, we thank you for what you did for us in Christ Jesus. For he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace, our well-being was laid on him. And with his stripes we are healed. Father, we believe your word. We believe your report. Father, we choose to believe you. Forgive our unbelief. Forgive our unbelief. Right now, discern the Lord's body. If there is any way you have sinned against God, confess it before him right now and ask him to forgive you. That's the way we judge ourselves through repentance so that we don't leave the judgment to God. Father, in all the ways we've, we, we've sinned against you, sinned against any one of your children or any man, Father, forgive us. Forgive me. In any way I've hurt anybody, knowingly or unknowingly, forgive me. In any way I've sinned against you, in all, every way I've disobeyed your holy orders, forgive me. Forgive every one of your children, oh God. Talking to you now, confessing their sins, forgive. Father, please forgive and let the healing begin now. Let the healing begin now. Let it turn around, begin now. Heavenly Father, thank you. Let your presence that makes a all the difference saturate all our homes. Let the presence of your spirit cause mighty favor in all our homes and in the life of everyone you have brought into any one of our homes. Let your favor be evident. Let your name be glorified. Father, heal bodies that are broken by sickness and disease. Heal minds that are confused and, 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 and malfunctioning. Heal our minds. Heal our bodies. Father, we approach this table in a new understanding. We approach this table in the freshness of the word you have given us. We stand on the authority of your word as we partake of the bread representing the body of Jesus that was broken for us and drink of the cup representing his blood that was shed for us. Father, we 
enter, we tap into the fullness of the new covenant provision for us as individuals, as families, as a church. In the name of Jesus Christ, let the power of the New Testament be evident in our lives and in our families. And in Olivet Bible Church, let this covenant work for us to its fullest. Align us with the covenant. Confirm your covenant with us. And let your name be glorified. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we are about to take. Let's thank God for the sacrifice of his son on our behalf. Say, Father, thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus on my behalf. He was wounded for my trust and the one that Jesus died for. And the one that he died for. When he hung on the cross, I was the one hanging there. It was my place he was taking. When he died, I died. When he went to hell, I went to hell. When he was chastised, when he was battered, I was battered, wounded. He was taking my place. Father, I relieved that moment when Jesus gave up his all for me. He went to hell on my behalf. When he conquered hell, death, and grave, that was my victory. When he was healed and his body restored, that was my restoration to health by his stripes. I'm healed. Father, thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name. Let me read again from 1 Corinthians 11. Let me read three verses. For I have received from the Lord, for I received from the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take it, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do you soften as you drink it in remembrance of me. Relieve what I did. Relieve that moment. I did it for you in remembrance of me. Say with me, Father, I thank you for the body of Jesus Christ that was broken for me. I discern the body of Jesus Christ. I distinguish it as being the last sacrifice you made for mankind. He died for me. It was my body that was to be broken. He took my place. So my body was broken, not to be broken again. I declare with my mouth, as I believe in my heart, I'm saved by the blood of Jesus. And I declare with my mouth, and I be, as I believe in my heart, he was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement necessary for my peace was laid on Jesus Christ. And by his stripes, I am healed. I am healed. I am healed. Father, going forward, I will query any sickness and disease that tries to come my way. I will not seize them as usual. I discern the body of Christ. I distinguish it. I'm one with him. I'm one spirit with Christ. And I'm one body with him. Thank you, Heavenly Father. I take the body of Jesus and I declare I'm healed. In Jesus' name. The cup, the new covenant ratified with his blood. As you're drinking of this cup, you're drinking the very blood of Jesus Christ. Respect that cup. See it as a distinguished thing. It's not a common thing. It's not an ordinary thing. It's the blood of the everlasting 
covenant. Ratify, that ratifies this new covenant, the blood that seals it. As we partake of the blood of Jesus, we are declaring we are one spirit with him. We are declaring we are saved by his blood. We are declaring our sins are forgiven. So declare I'm saved by the blood of Jesus. My sins are forgiven. I'm a child of God now because of the sacrifice of Jesus. Father, I thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Please your tithe. You can do online using the platforms that are provided. Um, the covenant presentation is a seed faith we sow at the first Sunday in our covenant service, the first Sunday of every month, and it's been powerful with us. God has, uh, in a lot of ways, shown himself strong on our behalf in our covenant services. So we sow a seed faith for the month that stretches ahead. It's a seed faith, or at the same time, it's a thanksgiving offering for the month that has passed by. We are talking of July now. That means God has been with us from January, February, March, April, May, June, and now we are in July, the second half of the year. Our eyes that have seen the beginning of July shall see the end of it. So lift up your offerings, give, do your giving online um, using the platforms that we have provided. Um, as I pray for you, just let's go in prayers before God now with your family. Present your family before God. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for seeing us through January, February, March, April, May, June, July. Not allowing anything that would destroy us to come upon us. You've delivered us from sin, sickness, and disease. From the traps of the enemy, you've delivered us from wicked men and women that are out there. You've not allowed any weapon formed against us to prosper. We've not, you've not allowed us to fall into the hands of wicked men. Robbers, assassins, will not come near us. Father, we depended on you for provision throughout the month of June, and you saw us through. We've seen your hand at work in our lives, in our families, in our affairs, in our businesses, in our, concerning our jobs. Father, we thank you for your grace that has been abundant with us. We thank you. We thank you for being faithful. Father, thank you for destroying the power of coronavirus as long as our homes and our boats and our persons are concerned. That evil shall never come near us, for it is written, no evil shall befall us and no plague shall come near our dwelling. Thank you for the immunity you have granted us and the wisdom you have given us in the mighty name of Jesus. And so, Father, another month stretches ahead of us, even the month of July. Father, we need you again. We need you to keep us, to protect us, guide our feet away from dangers. Lead us not into temptation. Any trap of the enemy, lead us away from it. My God, don't allow us to find ourselves in a wrong place at any time throughout this month. In the mighty name of Jesus. No virus, no bacteria, no evil shall befall us. No domestic accident, no car accident, no plane accident shall befall us. No mishap by boat. Father, no form of accident shall befall us in Jesus' name. We rebuke every fire outbreak, every form of fire accident. We rebuke you, fire, we quench you in advance in Jesus' name. Father, let your presence fill our homes, preserve our homes, preserve our lives in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we look up to you for security, we look up to you for provisions. Father, let all our targets be met and exceeded. And the things you have set in motion for us, Father, let this be the month of fulfillment. Let great and mighty things happen in this month of July. To your glory and honor in Jesus' name. July, the month of July, you will yield your increase to us. You will yield your fruits to us. In Jesus' name, every day shall be a testimony that will bring God glory. In Jesus' name. Throughout this month of July, every day shall be a plus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, abundantly supply for all our needs and to enable us to do things we ought to do in your kingdom. Every project is serviced. Thank you for divine acceleration. Thank you for increase and multiplication. 
thank you for increasing and multiplying us. Even Olivet Bible Church. We give you praise. Thank you for our sons and daughters and relations that are living far and near. Father, wherever they are, let the blood of Jesus cover everyone. Let the blood of Jesus cover every home. Cover our vehicles. Cover our properties, our houses, the food we eat, the clothes we wear, the water we drink. Let everything have a touch of the blood of Jesus Christ. Mark us very well with the blood. In Jesus' name we pray. Father, preserve our children in faith. Preserve them in, with life. Preserve them in wisdom and understanding. They shall be exemplary. They shall be exceptional. They shall be distinguished because they are the seed of the righteous. They shall be great in this land. In the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you, Father. Father, please, we ask again, destroy the coronavirus in all the continents of the earth. Father, if you will regard iniquity, who can stand? But with you is forgiveness that you may be feared. Your word says that. Father, if you look on man according to his iniquity, I don't know what continent can stand. But Father, have mercy. Give mankind another chance. Give mankind another chance. Intervene in Africa. Intervene in Nigeria. Intervene in, in, in Amuwa or Dauphin local government. Intervene in Lagos State. Intervene all over the states of Nigeria. Intervene all over Africa. Father, kill this virus. Kill it to its roots. Flush it out. Father, destroy this virus in Europe. Destroy it in Australia. Destroy it in North America. Destroy it in South America. Destroy it in the Antarctic region and in the Arctic region. Wherever this coronavirus is, Father, kill it to its roots. Have mercy on mankind. Let life return. Let life return. Give us another chance, Father. Let your name be glorified. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so I declare the prosperity and peace of God in your homes in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you for the great and mighty things you're doing in the lives of your children, in our families, amongst our loved ones. Thank you for the benefits of this covenant service. Thank you for things you have shifted, our bodies you have healed, light you have shaped for us. We give you thanks and we give you praise, almighty God, in Jesus' name. Father, accept the offerings of your people from your hands. Father, accept the offerings of your people from their hands. Visit them with grace. Honor their faith. Bless their inheritance in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. As I declare over you, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in Jesus' name. I speak peace into your life in Jesus' name. I speak peace into every home in Oliver Bible Church and our loved ones and all those who share this moment with us. I speak peace over you and into your homes in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you for the testimonies. Father, we expect good reports in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. All the glory and honor we give unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. I believe you are blessed by that message. And we hope to see you again next week. To pay your tithe or to give an offering, use the bank information displayed on the screen. And to contact us at any time during the week, use our contact information also displayed on your screen. And now, as we begin to close the service, let's pray over the offering and the tithes. In Jesus' name, our Father, we thank you for everyone that has given today. We thank you for your word that has come forth in power. We thank you for the blessing you have released upon your people. We thank you for your unconditional love for us, O oh God. Thank you for your mercy that has kept us thus far. My Father, my God, we commit ourselves into your hands, even in this week. Let your will be done. Let your protection be upon us. In Jesus' name, amen.